My name is Thomas Elliott, and I'm an undergraduate at Humboldt State University. Today, I'll be going over a derivation of Kepler's second and third laws. Let us begin by making the assumptions of Kepler's first law, that is, that planets move in an elliptical orbit. And note that the angular momentum, L, is a constant, so the change in angular momentum over time is zero. Um, we can also recall that the angular momentum is equal to the reduced mass mu times the cross product of the position with the velocity vectors. And the magnitude of that is this mu times the square root of g times big M times a times the quantity of 1 minus e squared, where the reduced mass mu is shown here, and big M is the sum of our two masses. So let us also look at some geometry of ellipses. We can see here this A is the semi-major axis, and B is the semi-minor axis, and the eccentricity E is related to the two in that fashion. Uh, the area of this ellipse is equal to pi times A times B. So the claim of Kepler's second law is that the change in area over change in time is a constant value, specifically one-half times the angular momentum divided by the reduced mass. We'll begin by looking at an infin infinitesimal piece of area over this small wedge. So this is the radius r, and it sweeps out a d theta. So this arc length is r d theta, and a tiny change in the radius is dr. Note that the dA here is equal to r dr d theta. So if we take this and we integrate over the entire wedge, that is the whole radius from 0 to r, is this dA equals 1 half r squared d theta. Now if we look at this uh, as it changes over time, so the ratio over time, and I've split up the r squared into r times r d theta dt, because we can see that r d theta dt is equal to the tangential velocity v theta, um, which is shown here. Where the velocity, or the derivative of the position vector, is equal to a radial um, portion plus a theta portion, a tangential. So next, we replace the r d theta dt with v theta, and we can see this r v theta, which is the uh, cross product of r v theta, or, or yeah, and um, we can see this cross product here gives us back what we had, and this cross product is also equal to the uh, absolute value of the angular momentum divided by the reduced mass. So here, if we just reduce um, if we substitute the angular momentum over the reduced mass for r v theta, then we have the uh, Kepler's second law. Moving on to Kepler's third law, um, we'll make the claim that p squared, the period of the orbit squared, is equal to 4 pi squared over g times the summation of the masses multiplied by the semi-major axis cubed. And we'll begin here with Kepler's second law, and we'll integrate over the entire period. And um, so if we integrate over the entire period, we see this area becomes the entire area of the ellipse. And this side on the right no time has no time dependence, and so we end up with just the period. Now we can remember that the area of the ellipse is pi times a times b, and so we'll replace that with the area. And now if we square both sides of this equation, we get this pi squared, a squared, b squared, is equal to 1 over 4, l squared over mu squared, times p squared. And if we remember that um, b squared is equal to a squared times 1 over e squared, oh my gosh, saying this all backwards, b squared is equal to a squared times the quantity of 1 minus e squared, 
and we have the angular momentum here, which I won't try to read to you. Um, and we can replace these things in our equation, and this is what we'll have, uh, where I've combined the a squared um, that we have on the left-hand side with the a squared here from this b. L squared, I simply uh, squared this value and put it here. And now what we can see is that the reduced masses on this right-hand side will cancel out. And each side has a 1 minus e squared, so those will cancel out. And if we multiply 4 over to the uh, left-hand side, then this is what we're left with. And uh, if we divide everything except for the period squared on this right-hand side, so the g times the summation of the masses times the semi-major axis, we divide all that over to this side, we end up with our original claim, that is that the period of a planet is equal to the semi-major, is related to the semi-major axis through this way. And we can also see that uh, we can find out the masses of the two objects from using this law. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, please let me know.